guys, it's Libby and I hope you are ready to hear about what I read in the month of February because that is what is going to happen right at this here web address. In February I finished four things, two of them were novels, one of them was a play, obviously, and one of them was an audiobook. So the first thing I read was the much-awaited third novel from Diane Setterfield. It's not quite as hard being a Diane Setterfield fan as it is being a Donna Tartt fan. We only have to wait sort of seven or eight years, but uh, the Tardies, is that what they call themselves, uh, have to wait ten years between her novels. But Donna Tartt does often do interviews between her novels. Diane Setterfield is very private. She does not have a Twitter. I cannot express to you how much I want her to have a Twitter account. Um, so Once Upon a River um, is set in the 19th century in England. A shocker for a book that Libby is reading. Um, and it's set on the banks of the Thames, uh, much further upstream than London, so it's fairly rural. Um, and unlike Bellman and Black and The Thirteenth Tale, Satterfield's other novels, this has quite a large cast of characters. But like her other novels, it is still very interested in storytelling. Um, here, more in the form of gossip um, and the stories that people create about the people around them. So when we open in this book, it is the night of the winter solstice, and uh, this was quite fortuitous because I started reading this book on the night of the winter solstice. Um, yes, it did take me a while to get through it. Um, uh, and we have a bunch of people in an inn, and in this inn, uh, while people are slowly getting drunk, um, they tell stories and um, gossip, but in a sort of a more story-type form as opposed to just quips. Um, and into this scene enters a man who is severely injured, carrying what everyone at first thinks is a doll, but turns out to be a small girl. Um, he uh, immediately collapses unconscious and she appears to be dead. So they go put this girl back in the back room, um, they fix up this man, his face has been split, um, he's, he's been in the river, he's doing very poorly. Uh, they get him under control and then the nurse who was tending to him goes to look at the girl, maybe try to figure out what she died of, and she has a pulse. And as we eventually learn, the man and the girl are not connected. He just found her out on the river. Um, which means, uh, well, in a normal situation, we would have a problem of not knowing who the girl's parents are. There are no candidates who will take this child. But in this case, we have too many candidates. And there are several parties who are like, oh yeah, that's my daughter, that's my sister shenanigans ensue. And I must say that the opening couple of chapters of this feel like a collection of short stories almost because we get um, the the backstory, a sort of neat tidy little backstory for all of our key players, um, one per chapter. And it, um, they're not particularly related to each other. Um, and that ends up being interesting as we move through this winding tale and trying to figure out who this girl belongs to and also some other mysteries that spin off of that mystery. Um, it sort of feels like we, the reader, are the only person who has all of the information who could possibly piece this all together. Um, now I do have to say, oh, I'm so sad that I have to say this, um, but I did not love this quite as much as The Thirteenth Tale and Bellman in Black. I think this book is very good, but it did not knock my socks off the way those two did. Um, and there were a couple places where it just felt weird. Um, like, this is happening, it's a little hard to figure out, but um, shortly after the publication of uh, On the Origin of Species and in the early days of photography. So I think we're in like the 1860s. Is that when On the Origin of Species was published? I really hope so. Um, so uh, there's this sort of attempt to tie in Darwinian notions about, you know, uh, humans once upon a time having been fish, um, which didn't really make sense or help and was kind of weird. Um, so I ended up giving this a four out of five. Um, hopefully we won't have to wait eight years for the next Diane Setterfield. In the meantime, I shall just reread Thirteenth Tale and Bellman of Black many more times.
Then I continued in the vein of historical fiction with a touch of the weird. Well, maybe more than a touch of the weird. I read Deathless by Catherine M. Valente. This is my second Cat Valente. I had previously read Radiance. And I must say, her cover designer over at Tor has a bit of a thing for uh, silhouettes of women in limited color palettes. This is a retelling, reworking, expansion, modernization of the Kashe the Deathless story, um, or the sort of several of the Kashe the Deathless stories from Russian folklore. Kashe the Deathless is the bogeyman who abducts people, as one is wont to do, and then heroes who are always named Prince Ivan and are always the third son uh, have to go off and, and rescue his captives. But this is not set in a legendary Russia, it is set in the Russia of the 20th century, and as you may know, some shit went down in the Russia of the 20th century. I think that for sure the first 50 pages of this book are this like beautiful flawless gem. We get to know a young Maria Morevna or possibly Morevna. I don't... Russian accenting is hard. Um, let's call her Maria. Um, who lives in what uh, at the beginning of the book is called St. Petersburg, but will eventually be called Petrograd and then Leningrad. Um, and uh, we meet her when she's six years old. Um, she sees a bird on a tree branch outside her house, and then it goes splat onto the ground and up pops a man. Um, who goes uh, and ends up marrying one of her older sisters. Uh, three years later, the same thing happens to her next sister, and then the same thing happens to her next sister. But we also get to see the transformation from a Tsarist to a communist Russia through the eyes of a child, through like a real heavy dose of magical realism, as you would expect from Kat Valente. I think that the story of the early to mid Soviet Union actually lends itself really well to magical realist retellings because in magical realism you say things and everyone knows they're not true but you can see the truth underneath even though it sometimes isn't even related and in the Soviet Union you, you had to do that as well you had to say things that you knew weren't true and that everyone around you was aware weren't true but you would get in some serious trouble if you didn't say them and then one day when she is not looking a bird goes splat out of the tree and jumps up and it is Kasha the Deathless and he um, I guess proposes to her uh, at her front door and then she just leaves and she goes off with him to the magical land of life. So um, in this world there are various uh, tsars and tsaritsas of archetypal things. Life, death, the length of an hour, water, birds, salt. There's another one that I think I'm forgetting. And then we move into the part of the novel that is more fantasy oriented and less magical realism. Or do we? <laughs> Who knows? Um, so I really liked this. Um, it, it does take some getting used to um, when you start reading Cat Valente's more Baroque writing style. Um, and I had an easier time getting through this than through Radiance. Um, and I don't know if that's because it is easier or if I just had a dress rehearsal with Radiance and then this was my opening night. And so I have currently given it four stars. However, I highly suspect that on a reread this would go up to five stars because I like the first part so much and then when we move on to the more fantasy part it's just so strange that I needed a little more time to get oriented um, and then once we move through the fantasy part a lot of it is focused on the Siege of Leningrad which if you don't know was pretty bad um, and it's hard to feel like happy when you're reading about the Siege of Leningrad like oh yeah I loved this book. I definitely want to go through that experience. Again, right now, it made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend this. Uh, it is an acceptable first Cat Valente novel. Uh, wow, it is not for children, though. <laughs>
And then, of course, I finished the Bard Book Club read, which was Richard II this month. Um, you can go check out my 45-minute long video talking about this. Um, so I'm not going to say anything here. I will just let the gods choose a line for me to read so you can enjoy some of its beauty. Reproach and disillusion hangeth over him. And that means that the last thing I read this month was the audiobook. Um, it was an 18th century novel, and that means that it must answer the question, can this unthrone Elizabeth Inchbald's A Simple Story? Hi, Nova. I was getting all dramatic, Noves. Can this unthrone Elizabeth Inchbald's A Simple Story? Ugh, nope. As my favorite 18th century novel. She's just staring at me now. I gave you dinner. Okay, I have been given permission to continue filming, but I have to leave the window open, so sorry if there's background noise. I'll try to talk louder. Um, so I haven't even said what book I read. It was The Female Quixote by Charlotte Lennox, which is the earliest of the 18th century novels that I've read so far. It was published in, I think, 1752. My other ones have all been 1770s, 80s, 90s. Um, so, no, it is not as good as A Simple Story by Elizabeth Inchbald. But that's okay. We can't all be. So in order to explain what's going on in this book, I have to go quite a bit into other literary histories. So, um, you may be familiar with the genre of romance, which is different than the romance genre. Um, the genre of romance um, is uh, the group of sort of chivalric, um, courtly love-focused stories that were published in the Middle Ages and then into the Renaissance and um, the early modern period, um, largely in France, but also a bit in Germany, Italy, and Spain. They tell of knights in shining armor and their ladies fair, um, and they often are semi-based on actual historical figures, but uh, largely fictionalizing their lives in order to give the most swoon-worthy romance. And then in the early 17th century, Miguel de Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, which is about a slightly senile man who reads a whole bunch of these romances uh, and then decides that he is a knight errant who will sally forth into the world to right all wrongs. I am I, Don Quixote, the Lord of La Mancha, my destiny calls and I go. And so he is, if you will, the male Quixote, who thinks he is one of the male characters in a chivalric romance. And our female Quixote is a young Miss Arabella, who has also read too many of these romances and now thinks that she is the heroine in one of them. This novel has that classic pre-Jane Austen problem of having static characters rather than dynamic characters, so Arabella doesn't really get to change over the course of the story. Um, the, the way that the book is set up, it's pretty much premise, result, result, result. We have a whole bunch of different scenarios resulting from our premise of she reads too many romances, which means that this book is quite episodic, and I strongly suspect that aside from the first five and the last five chapters, you could read the chapters in any order and it would all make sense. Arabella goes around London expecting to be kidnapped by brigands at every turn. She haughtily rejects any man so presumptuous as to imply that he is attracted to her, which none of the men are actually doing because they think she's weird, uh, but she interprets everything in a more lowercase r romantic sense than it is intended, uh, all except for one man, her cousin, who actually quite likes her, even though she's a weirdo. Uh, she wears outrageous get-ups in the style of the Princess Julia, daughter of um, Augustus Caesar, which is very confusing to the dressmaker, who is at first afraid that she hasn't been sufficiently keeping up with the latest fashions, but then realizes, oh, she wants like a Roman dress. How the heck am I gonna do that? So it's all acceptably entertaining, but it fails to become more than the sum of its parts. So I really, really, really wanted to give the female Quixote 2.5 stars, but Goodreads will not let me. That is the star rating that this book deserves, but I'm a nice 
nice person. I thought maybe I could come up with a with an idiom there, but apparently not. I'm too much a pushover. I'm a pushover. And I gave it the three stars on Goodreads. That's half a star that it does not deserve. Um, yeah, so that's everything I read in February. This has been great, guys. Talk to you later.